Good afternoon, everyone. Honored guests, members of the Montpelier Board of Directors, President Imhoff and Montpelier staff, members of the James Madison University Board of Visitors, faculty, students, and alumni, family, friends, and fellow Madison enthusiasts, it's my great honor to speak at this hallowed place. As you know, on this day, 262 years ago, James Madison was born. Such a gesture is especially meaningful on this day and at this place in terms of the wreaths. But perhaps more so than any other president or founder, James Madison is responsible for the creation and miraculous endurance of our republic. Known as the father of the Constitution, James Madison's contributions to our nation should be remembered by every American. The sacred fire of liberty lit by Madison's ideas burns to this day and draws us here to honor him. I came to Montpelier for the first time only a few months ago. As a great admirer of James Madison, to me here, the trip felt like a, a pilgrimage. When the mansion first came into view as we made our way up the long sweeping drive, I was struck by the majesty of the moment as we feel when in the presence of greatness. During that visit, Montpelier Board President Greg May invited me to speak at this annual event as we strode down a pathway that Madison himself must have walked many times. I could not have been more honored. Indeed, this is a dream come true for me. As a political science major and history minor in college, I read many of the same texts Madison himself studied as well as some of Madison's own work. Even as a young child, I admired the creative genius of our forefathers. While other kids had stuffed animals or model airplanes displayed in their bedrooms, on my dresser I proudly exhibited a set of small ceramic statues of the American presidents. I, it's true. I, I, I liked to root for underdogs and was always partial to Madison because his was the shortest statue. Today his picture hangs proudly in my office. As many of you know, Montpelier and James Madison University have long had a special bond. It began when Dr. Clarence Geyer, an archaeologist at Madison, arranged an archaeology field school here at Montpelier more than 25 years ago. Our students and faculty have been coming to Montpelier ever since and have participated in digs all across the grounds, except for right here, of course. They are not allowed to dig in this particular area, you never know, with undergraduates. From then, the relationship between our two institutions has blossomed. This past November, a bus containing JMU faculty, staff, and me, as well as my wife, Marianne, and daughter, Eleanor, came here to spend a day brainstorming with the Montpelier leadership and staff on ways to deepen our relationship even further. The primary objective of this deeper relationship is to bring more attention to James Madison and his ideas. This objective reflects the missions of our two great institutions, but it must go beyond those gathered here today. As a nation, we're in great need of what I call a return to Madison. It's true that during the past few years, more and more American citizens are professing respect for the U.S. Constitution. The document was read on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives for only the second time in history this past January. In fact, Representative Bob Goodlatte of Virginia's 6th District, JMU's district, opened the reading with a delivery of the document's preamble. That's a good start but as a nation we must go much further. For this newfound reverence toward the Constitution to elevate us as a nation, we must explore and gain a deeper understanding of the principles on which the Constitution is based. We must return to Madison. Now by suggesting this return, I don't mean that we become a nation of history buffs, although that would be okay with me. Rather, a return to Madison would provide us with very real and practical insights into how we as a society should confront issues facing us all. Starting with a realistic view of human nature, Madison believed that politics was driven by interest, not virtue. In his excellent work, The Sacred Fire of Liberty, Madison scholar Lance Banning captured this core principle. He wrote, Madison did not assume that a republic could depend upon a superhuman readiness to sacrifice self-interest to the common good. Taking humans for the interested, opinionated creatures they are, Madison asserted that in a pluralistic, large republic, partial interests would be counterbalanced 
by competing interests. This was not new political thinking, of course. During the 16th century in Florence, Machiavelli, whose work was more nuanced than is often remembered today, explored what he called the effectual truth of politics. In other words, as Paul Rahi writes in his book, Machiavelli's Liberal Republican Legacy, in order to avoid their ruin and achieve their preservation, men should govern themselves in accordance with how they do behave, rather than in the distorting light of how they ought to. So Madison's great innovation was to devise a system of government that sought to create political and civic conditions, allowing the interests of individual citizens, groups, regions, and other entities to balance one another so that no one could overtake the rest. He recognized that we'd be a society with diverse perspectives and experiences and that we needed a structure to allow that diversity to flourish. Today, while publicly professing faith in the Constitution as a document, we seem to have forgotten this essential element. Far too often our public discourse on the important challenges of our time degenerates into shallow shouting matches and name calling in which we cry for the elimination of opposing views on political, social, economic, and cultural issues. The people we despise across the political aisle, the fools on the television spouting their ridiculously wrong-headed opinions, the heathens who believe in a different God than we do. We not only hold them in utter contempt, we behave, behave as if we want their ideas extinguished. And if they were extinguished, oh, if they were only extinguished, we believe the world would be a better place. If only we all agreed on everything, wouldn't that be great? Yet, we must be careful what we wish for. If that kind of wish were to come true, not only would our lives be much more boring, but our society would stop progressing and stagnate. A return to Madison would shine a light on the fact that the strengths of our republic relies on the existence of opposing ideas and perspectives. Without the diversity of ideas and opinions, our civic balance would tilt and our system eventually would topple. The great man we honor today knew this was true. Boy, do we need a return to Madison. Madison's Federalist 10 is recognized the world over as one of the great examples of political thought in history. You might remember that Madison published the Federalist with Alexander Hamilton and John Jay in newspapers while the states were considering whether to ratify the proposed Constitution. Of these 85 essays, Madison's 10th is considered to be one of the best, and it's about balancing competing interests. I love it for the philosophy it expresses, but also because it contains one of his most elegant turns of a phrase. If you've read much Madison, you know that his writing can at times be dense and elliptical. He's not often quoted in today's soundbite culture. But in the Federalist 10, he wrote, Liberty is to faction what air is to fire. Think about that. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire. He was making the point that liberty creates a nourishing environment for faction. At the time, great fear existed that too much liberty could lead to dangerous factions emerging. But he was resolute and said, but it could not be a less folly to abolish liberty, which is essential to political life because it nourishes faction, than it would be to wish the annihilation of air, which is essential to animal life, because it imparts to fire its destructive agency. So he's saying that even though liberty allows faction to thrive, it should not be curtailed. Thus, Madison advocated for liberty despite its dangers, and he was sure to remind his readers that man's passionately held views are imperfect. So if we claim to respect our Constitution and understand this fundamental premise, we have a responsibility to change the tone of much of our civic dialogue. Think about that, to change the tone of our civic dialogue. If Madison were here today, I believe he'd remind us of our human limitations when we encounter and react to opinions that differ from our own. We can all benefit from trying to listen to and understand the views of others with civility and respect, even as we hold and, es and espouse our own cherished points of view. As the president of the university named for James Madison, I feel strongly that our institution can best honor his legacy by embracing the diversity of perspectives and backgrounds in our society while fostering and modeling civil and respectful discourse on the great issues of our time. This is part of the reason why I began my own presidency with a listening tour to hear and learn from the richly diverse voices and opinions of our university community. 
In my inaugural address yesterday, I called for James Madison University to be the national model for the engaged university, an institution that combines a commitment to teaching and learning with a conviction that all humans are interconnected. This combination embodies James Madison's ideals. If we enlighten ourselves through education and believe that we are all connected, even with those with whom we might passionately disagree, we honor Madison. Another hallmark of our institution will be to continue to deepen the relationship between our university and Montpelier. And some of these ideas are already taking shape. For instance, our faculties are working together to create a course about James Madison and his ideas that includes online and in-person instruction as well as visits here. And it will be available to our students and to the general public. As we celebrated Madison Week these past few days, Montpelier has honored our university by loaning us several artifacts from its own collection. These exchanges are reminders of the man to whom we owe so much. Our educational initiatives can go a long way to motivate those who profess their faith in the Constitution to deepen their understanding of its underlying principles and thus inspire a return to Madison. As an advocate of education and an ardent student himself, I believe Madison would have enjoyed meeting today's students who benefit from this legacy in this free and civil society. I wonder how we would have felt meeting students attending the university named for him. We have several with us here today. Can you come and join me for a moment? As many of you know, JMU has a robust study abroad program. Along with our rector and others, several of our study abroad programs this summer will be visited by a number of us. And one of our stops will be in Florence, the great city where Republican thought reemerged during the 16th century. Machiavelli was the most influential political thinker of that time, and his work influenced Madison greatly. In fact, Machiavelli appears in one of James Madison's adolescent commonplace books. A commonplace book was like an academic diary. Students during the era when Madison grew up dutifully filled their commonplace books with notations, quotations, and poetry. Students of our era, such as these fine students and I, will visit the gravesite of Machiavelli at the Basilica di Santa Croce in central Florence this summer. We'll take with us the moving experience of being here at James Madison's gravesite and reflect on the Republican ideal with which both men and so many people throughout history have grappled. It's quite fitting that students attending a university named for James Madison make this journey, connect these places, and contemplate their meeting. With this symbolic gesture, we hope to inspire all the students of James Madison University, the visitors to Montpelier, and all who bear witness to return to Madison. Let's go from this ceremony with a renewed sense of our role as citizens and of the power we have to live the ideals James Madison handed down to us through the ages. Thank you.